The America of today, if you were to compare it to some decades ago, is a dramatically different culture. And in many, many ways, it is reflecting many other parts of the world. <clears throat> it was Malcolm Muggeridge, who was probably one of the leading commentators of the cultural rot in the 1970s, who said this. <clears throat> I had the privilege of being with Muggeridge seven months before he died. It was a dream for me to be with him. I think the most articulate and uh, poignant journal English journalist of the 20th century. It is a toss-up between him and G.K. Chesterton. Muggeridge's books are so remarkable. If you haven't read some of his writings, here was a man who knew how to turn a phrase, and he once said, if he ever stood before God and God would give him a moment or two to ask for forgiveness, one of the things he would ask for forgiveness for was for being so fatally fluent. <clears throat> he was editor of Punch magazine and a great writer. And Muggeridge said a couple of things that were so, I think, prophetic that I want to read at least one of them for you and begin my message by pointing out how fascinating it is what he said 40 or 50 years ago. First, he said this, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down until at last, having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. Writing in the 70s, created, you know, boredom out of our own affluence, impotence out of our own erotomania, vulnerability out of our own strength. We blow the trumpet that brings the walls of our own cities crashing down until at last having educated himself into imbecility and drugged himself into stupefaction. You see, there's nothing so vulgar left in the human experience for which you cannot bring in some Ivy League professor from somewhere to justify it. And writing in the 40s, it was Aldous Huxley, the humanist, who reminded us, we are living today not in the delicious intoxication of the early successes of science, rather in the grisly morning after, where it has become quite apparent that what science may have actually done is to introduce us to improved means in order to obtain hitherto unimproved or rather deteriorated ends. What science may have done is to introduce us to improved means in order to obtain hitherto unimproved or rather deteriorated ends. So when a humanist points it out like that, and when a cultural uh, critic like Muggeridge points it out, and then we read these words from Muggeridge, which I think are so powerful, because writing in that latter part of the 20th century, he was at that time chaplain of Edinburgh University, and at the famed St. Giles in Scotland, when he offered in his resignation and left the university scene, he left it because of decisions that were being made in higher education that he thought were going to be destructive and decimating, ultimately, of young minds. One of the things they had made decisions at that point was to hand out contraception to university students and so on as a gesture that this is the kind of lifestyle we lead anyway, so we may as well support you in this fashion. And in his last message, out of the famed pulpit, where Knox too had thundered forth, he said this, so dear Edinburgh students, this may well be the last time I address you, and this is what I want to say to you, and I don't really care whether it means anything to you or not, and whether you think there is anything in it or not. I want you to believe that this row I have had with your elected officers has nothing to do with any puritanical attitudes on my part. I have no belief in abstinence for abstinence's own sake, no wish under any circumstances to check any fulfillment of your life and being. But but I have to say to you this, that whatever life is or is not about, it is not to be expect, expressed in terms of drug stupefaction and casual sexual relations. However else we may venture into the unknown, it is not, it is not I assure you, 
on the plastic wings of Playboy magazine or psychedelic fancies. However we venture forth into the future, it is not going to be on the plastic wings of Playboy magazine or psychedelic fancies. Fascinating that he, as a journalist, was talking in those terms. And the famed theologian Carl F. Henry, uh, I had the privilege of studying under him in my days at Trinity. He made this comment in one of his books. Biblical truth, transcultural as it is, has an indispensable message for contemporary culture. It addresses modern learning, modern ethics, modern political economic concerns, and all the idolatries of our polytheistic society. It proclaims the gospel to a generation that is intellectually uncapped, morally unzippered, and volitionally uncurbed. Those who consider the latest fads permanently in will of course dismiss the Christian message as the last hurrah of an antiquated outlook. They reveal their sickness of soul by derogating terms like morality, piety, family, work, patriotism, born again and evangelical theology. Christmas Christianity they dismiss as a kind of middle class hedonism declaring it to be intellectually inadmissible. They meanwhile espise a life that neither reason nor conscience or spirit can support or condone. Repression of sensuality and of self-gratification they call psychotically abnormal. Subordin of the subordination of the flesh they leave to medieval monks or consigned to the future resurrection. Affirming sexual pleasure to be the supreme good of a life of unending revelry, they waste away into ethical ghosts and skeletons. How much more graphic can intellectual solid thinkers get than that? Intellectually uncapped and morally unzippered. We are wasting away into ethical ghosts and skeletons. The body which is intended to be the temple of God has now become the, or the object of idolatry in the perverse sense of the term and we measure everything in life by the gratification that this can bring to us and lost our way on the sacredness for which this was intended. Into this arena, into this kind of a situation you and I are called as missionaries to take the message wherever it is that God has placed you and is calling you to minister.